Sir, now, sir, you said, hello, now start, sir. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. And welcome once again to the teaching class of Department of Urology, Savai Mansingh Medical College, Jaipur. Today, uh, we have a presentation on localized RCC, its evaluation and management. And this will be done by uh, Dr. Yes. Yes, Sharma, and would be moderated by our faculty, Dr. Manoj Kumar. So, uh, Dr. Yes, uh, start your presentation, please. Share your presentation. Go ahead. Go ahead. Your your audio is not there. Your audio is not there. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, faculty members and respected seniors and my colleagues. Today I am going to present uh, my presentation on localized RCC. So let's know about what is a localized RCC. It is a stage one and uh, T one and T two without any. Yes, there is some audio issue. Audio is not clear. Or any localized RC. Go ahead. Audio, audio has to be clear. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, to, the incidence of uh, RCC, localized RCC in adult patients are usually 3% of all cancers. Small renal mass is usually a contrast enhancing solid or cystic lesion that consistent with the clinical stage of T1A of RCC, out of which 80% are malignant, which is low grade and early stage. According to the TNM classification, the localized RCC involves T1 and T2, which is uh, limited to the kidney. And small renal masses are usually uh, tumors which is less than or equal to 4 cm. About radiological investigations, we can, uh, ultrasound can be done, then CT urography with high resolution, in which triple phase study with non-contrast, nephrogenic phase and delayed excretory phase uh, can demonstrate a uh, a tumor better enhancement of more than 15 Hounsfield unit without the fat to be demonstrated in the delayed images is more in favor of malignant diseases and MRI can be done in patients who having a dye allergy pregnant patients improved Im, uh, improved imaging uh, in MRI is used nowadays like multi-parametric MRI dynamic contrast enhancement and diffusion weighted MRI more recently, advanced molecular imaging are also seen in which radio labeled antibodies to particularly mark the tumor markers of RCC, like PET CT for detection of technetium 99 and iodine 124 labeled chimeric antibody against carbonic anhydrase 9 enzyme, which having a good specificity according to the clinical features. Incidental tumors usually located within the retroperitoneum, usually asymptomatic and non-palpable, and more than 60% of the RCCs are usually incidental. In localized diseases, there is usually a triad of a flank pain, abdominal mass, and hematuria, which is not so common. Less than 10% patients usually show this uh, triad. And spontaneous perineal hematoma can also be a suspicious of a tumor. More than 50% of uh, Spontane uh, occult renal tumor shows a uh, perirenal hematoma, most commonly in AML and RCC. And symptoms of advanced diseases like constitutional symptoms of weight loss, fever, malaise, and we can think of obstruction to IVC either by tumor or lymph node obstruction if patient is having bilateral 
lower extremities edema and non reducing varicocele and if patient is having bone pain and persistent cough and cervical lymphadenopathy we can think of metastatic disease these are the incidences of paraneoplastic syndrome in rcc and particularly about the stauffer syndrome it is a non metastatic liver dysfunction usually presents in 3% to 20% of the rcc patients in depending on the uh, stage of tumor in which initial finding is elevated serum alp levels then later on elevated prothrombin time and hypoalbuminemia then if patients develops thrombocytopenia neutropenia weight loss and fever then advanced stage of stauffer syndrome in which hepatic necrosis can be seen the role of biopsies in the small renal masses false negative results and fear of catastrophic complication we uh, due to fear of catastrophic complications in past we usually debarred the biopsy in uh, small renal masses but nowadays with increase advancement in uh, imaging nowadays less than 1% of the patient experience complication like bleeding or other complication which require intervention so biopsy can be done by radiographic guidance major concern is uh, needle tract seeding which can be uh, reduced by use of coaxial technique in renal mass biopsy with molecular profiling benign masses 20% we can say and in aggressive patients we can go for radical nephrectomy in benign and indolent patients we can do active surveillance and in indolent cancers thermal ablation and partial nephrectomy can be done what is the goal for management of early rcc is a overall free cancer free survival for the patient preservation of the renal function avoidance of the treatment related morbidity morbidity and patient central quality of life so what are the treatment options we have in a uh, conventional treatment option we have in uh, localized rcc are radical nephrectomy partial nephrectomy thermal ablation and active surveillance radical nephrectomy is a gold standard curative procedure for any uh, tumor uh, any kidney mass in surgical principle we do uh, early ligation of renal artery and vein removal of kidney outside the zerota fascia removal of ipsilateral adrenal gland and complete lymphadenectomy from the crux of diaphragm to the aortic bifurcation so here is the video here is a video showing a uh, early clipping of renal artery then clipping of renal vein and then clipping and dividing of ureter now whole of the kidney in with zerota fascia can be extracted in endobag coming on the nephron sparing uh, surgeries there are certain types of nephron spacing surgeries like oral polar resection if the mass is involved any of the pole of kidney enucleation if it is more of exophytic mass superficial mass and small size then coming on the wedge resection if the tumor is involved at the convex side of the kidney and excavation or enucleo resection here is a video of partial nephrectomy in which we apply a tourniquet in a renal artery
then we dissect the loop small renal tumor involving the normal parenchyma of kidney then we suture up the resected margins of normal parenchyma so about the partial nephrectomy uninvolved portion of the kidney is preserved is associated with a better outcome as compared to the radical nephrectomy and more importantly recent evidences suggest better results with partial nephrectomy in view of survival coming on the nephrometry score there are certain parameters of radius then exophytic or exo endophytic properties nearness to the uh, collecting system nearness to the collecting system or sinus anterior posterior and location related to the polar lines out of which if we score the tumor if it is comes near by 4 to 6 then it, these are these are the ideal candidates for partial nephrectomy indication for nephron sparing surgeries usually we do this type of uh, nephron sparing surgeries in small renal masses but in case of bilateral uh, rccs rccs involving a solitary functioning kidney unilateral rccs with a functioning opposite functioning opposite kidney but affected with the chronic pyelonephritis any stone diseases or any patient who is going to be a nephric or need a dialysis in immediate post op so partial nephrectomy requires more detailed understanding of renal anatomy hence we need uh, extensive preoperative imaging studies arteriography is usually useful for non peripheral tumors encompassing two or more renal arterial segments and selective renal venography is performed in which patient having a large or central located tumor differential renal function to be done by isotope venography these are a 3d uh, ct scan which shows a better anatomy and better delineation of tumor in comparison in view of uh, approximate with the renal veins and hilum go ahead yes
Uh, there are types of certain effect, uh, types of partial nephrectomy like simple inulication, polar segmental nephrectomy, wedge resection, transverse resection, and extracorporeal partial nephrectomy with renal autotransplant. So, in simple inulication, we do a circumferential incision of the renal, renal parenchyma around the tumor with simple excision of the tumor with maximal preservation of the normal parenchyma. Leaving risk of leaving residual malignant tissue is there. It, it is usually done in Whipple uh, Lindau diseases and multiple low stage encapsulated tumor involving the both kidneys. Then comes the segmental polar nephrectomy in which a tumor which is confined to any pole of kidney we perform by isolating and ligation of segmental, apical or basilar art arterial branches is dissected, ligated and divided. Then according to the ischemic line of demarcation, we do a excision and reapproximation of resected margins. Then comes the wedge resection, which is uh, in which a tumor, which is located usually at the convex surface of the kidney, not confined to any pole. Risk of heavier bleeding is there. Temporary renal arterial occlusion and surface hypothermia is there. In wedge resection, the tumor is removed with the margin of normal renal parenchyma. Then comes the transverse resection in which it is done in a large tumor which involves the upper and lower portion of the kidney in which a major branches of the renal artery and veins supplying the tumor bearing portion of the kidneys are identified in the renal hilum, ligated and divided. Then comes the extracorporeal partial nephrectomy and autotransplant which is firstly described by Calne and then Gitte and McClum popularized it in 1975, indicated in large complex tumor involving the renal hilum, in which we take out the kidney, then we do resection and the reapproximation and like kidney transplant, we again autotransplant in the same patient. The advantages of this type of uh, exc excision is uh, resection is having optimal exposure, bloodless surgical field, maximum conservation of the renal parenchyma and greater protection of the kidney from prolonged ischemia. Certain D, D advantages is also there. There is an increased risk of temporary and permanent renal failure because of the longer operative procedure and for vascular and ureteric anastomosis. Then comes the thermal ablation, which is usually uh, we do in advanced age of patient, significant comorbidities, local recurrence after previous nephron sparing surgeries and multifocal tumors. Then the cryoablation, for to achieve target destruction and predominant volume of tissue, it can be done laparoscopic or percutaneous. Various type of ablation energies can be used. The mechanism of action is uh, by doing a rapid freezing, slow thawing and repetition of freezing for cycle, which lead to a cytonecrosis by two step process, rapid intercellular ice formation and delayed microcirculatory failure during the thaw cycle. Argon gas and helium, helium gas are two gases which we use in uh, this. Argon gas usually uh, ha having a rapid freezing temperature at the probe of minus 80 degrees and helium ga ga gas usually release heat, it depressurize and rapid thaw. There are uh, direct injuries and indirect injuries of this uh, triablation. In direct injuries are usually uh, by making a ice formation and indirect injuries by targeting a small blood vessels, creating a hypo, hypoxic microenvironment. This cryo lesion is usually created by 3.4 millimeter diameter of cryo probe. So what are the indications? It's usually indicated in small renal muscles, larger lesions, which require two or more probe, technically difficult, might leave residual tumor, Solitary lesion located away from collected system and elderly patients. There are certain contraindications like coagulopathy, significant post-operative additions, intraanal or centrally located tumor. Certain complications 
we usually see in triablation like uh, urinary fistula, post-operative hemorrhage, injury to the collecting system, and injury to the adjacent structures. Then comes the radio frequency ablation, which uh, in which uh, radio frequency waves creates a friction uh, friction of water, which creates heat and destroys tumor. Homogeneous radio frequency electrodes creates a temperature near around 50 to 100 centigrade. So it can be done also by laparoscopic or percutaneous tech, uh, reasons. Radio frequency ablation can be performed using a dry or wet technique. In wet technique, we use the hydro uh, hypertonic saline, which promotes centrifugal dissipation of radio frequency energy, resulting in rapid creation of large radio lesions without early tissue dissection, as seen in dry type. Dissection. So, in radio frequency ablation, pre ablation, we can see the tumor over here. Then, post uh, three months post uh, radio frequency ablation, the lesion going uh, is hypo uh, attenuating. Then, in post uh, 12 months after the radio frequency ablation, the gradual contrast residual scar is contracted. Do you use the term After ablation, we do a follow up by uh, routine blood work and imaging. Then, uh, imaging of CT or MRI within six month, weeks of initial therapy, and then six, 12, 18, and uh, 24 months. And then we can do a biopsy of suspic uh, suspicious of residual tissue. And active surveillance we can do in patients with severe comorbidities, relative uh, indication in patients with stable with severe comorbidities. And if patients want uh, to do uh, active surveillance and ready to for come for follow-up, then we can do active surveillance. No intervention, no surgery, no procedure that has that are invasive is the main uh, principle for active surveillance. Initially imaging at three to six months interval for the first uh, first year and subsequent imaging at the six to 12 months. There are certain disadvantages of the active surveillance like real metastatic uh, potential of tumor, patient longevity and uh, not usually accurately predictable, cost of frequent surveillance studies and anxiety. There are certain future trends for small renal masses like extracorporeal, high frequency, high intensity focused ultrasound, which is usually a least invasive tumor ablation in which we use uh, ablative ultrasonic frequencies generated by a physioelectric element. This beam is focused on the lesion like ESWL and lithotripsy, resulting in thermal destruction like tissue cooking by raising a temperature of 70 to 80 degrees, initially used in DPH and uh, carcinoma prostate patients. There are certain persons, uh, concerns regarding this is incomplete tumor ablation and superficial skin burns. Then comes the stereotactic radio surgery in which a cyber knife of six megawatt frameless linear oscillating mounted on a computer controlled robotic arm is still be considered experimental with improved well-designed prospective trials, stereotactic uh, radio surgeries may be treatment of RCCs. Then comes the microwave thermotherapy, in which is flexible, targeting the lesion and creating an electromagnetic field which causes rapid ion oscillation and frictional heat, which is similar to the radio frequency ablation. Then comes the laser interstitial thermal therapy which is specialized laser fibers to deliver energy directly to the tissue, which creates heat more than 55 degrees centigrade and creates a tissue necrosis. Then comes the chemo ablation and combined chemo ablation with radio frequency ablation. Previously, chemo ablation was done, but results of chemo ablation are not so good. So nowadays, combined chemo ablation with radio frequency ab ablation is usually used in which we use a 
95% ethanol, 24% hypertonic saline, and 50% acetic acid gels. Then comes the targeted embolization and ablation, in which these are usually helpful in highly vascular centralized lesion, which are often inadequately ablated due to owing to heat sink phenomena, which is usually seen in radio frequency ablation. Selective embolization, more homogeneous heating, and improved tissue necrosis. And use of targeted angioembolization prior to uh, radio frequency ablation remains investigation. There are certain prognostic models in uh, EUA guidelines of 2023, in which city uh, of uh, California staging and grants model are usually for all type. Leibovich 2023 model is usually for clear type. Leibovich 2018 is usually for clear cell type papillary and chromophobe, and Venus model is for papillary. Thank you, Yash. Uh, so, in the meantime, I would request all the residents to please uh, have your queries and uh, anything that probably he has missed, let me know. So as we all know, uh, localized RCC again is a very important topic, both from your academic point of view, training, and we are getting a lot of these patients. So basically they can be symptomatic or asymptomatic. Asymptomatic are usually detected by imaging studies, which are done for some other reasons. Uh, by CD or ultrasound, that is incidental omas. And uh, we evaluate these patients uh, by imaging study, and this is usually a CD scan, a renal protocol CD scan. So uh, the management of uh, localized RCC, as he said, could be varying from active surveillance to a radical nephrectomy. And active surveillance is usually done in patients uh, who are not either fit for surgery or they have a lot of comorbidities and uh, they do not want the surgery. And patients who have small renal masses, which is less than one centimeter, it is said that 40% of these lesions are benign. So this is again one of the option uh, for small renal masses less than one centimeter. So small renal masses between one to three centimeter, then again, there is either active surveillance or you do a nephron sparing surgery. So if you are trying to do a nephron sparing surgery uh, and active surveillance, you can there is a role of biopsy uh, which can prove whether this is a high grade aggressive malignancy or it's a low grade indolent kind of malignancy or a benign lesion and even you can um, follow up these patients and see the growth of the tumor if it is less than 5 ml per 5 mm per year then probably it's a slow brain tumor and indolent tumor you can keep following them up nephron sparing surgery we all know uh, is the treatment of choice wherever we can do a partial nephrectomy we would like to do because as he said there is a less uh, chance of uh, uh, ckd progression plus overall survival also is better in patients with partial nephrectomy because the other cardiovascular morbidities that follow increased uh, ckd or increased kidney damage is not there in partial nephrectomy so uh, patients of SRM, uh, if it is more than uh, three centimeters, three to four centimeters, <laughs> do more of nephron sparing surgery. Radical nephrectomy is usually the treatment of choice. If you think the patient is a large tumor, uh, usually if it is involving the perinephric fat or the adrenal vein or the renal vein, then radical nephrectomy will be the treatment of choice. Then Nephron sparing, again, as I said, there are various indications uh, where we would 
definitely like to do a partial nephrectomy that is a solitary kidney, uh, bilateral tumors, multiple tumors, patients with CKD, the other disease, kidney is diseased, etc. Bilateral tumors uh, can be present in patients of like BHL, tuberous sclerosis, hereditary renal cancer syndrome, and uh, papillary uh, RCC. So these patients, again, we would do uh, try to prefer doing uh, nephron sparing surgery because these patients <coughs> tend to develop a recurrent tumor and they need a closer follow-up. So if they develop recurrent tumor, there is a chance if you do a radical nephrectomy on one side, then you do not uh, keep um, the patient with any kind of nephrons because the rest of the kidney also, if gets involved, you have to do some surgery. So this is uh, basically uh, the management that is uh, followed in most of these patients. And if you find that the patient has a kind of a, uh, a locally advanced tumor, which is uh, involving the gerodos, T3 <coughs> or other lesions of the node is involved, then uh, it comes under the category of high risk or intermediate high risk category and the chances of recurrence is high. As I said, there are various prognostic models. models. Uh, one is by UCLA, where if the chance of recurrence is more than 30%, then you would give an adjuvant therapy in the form of pembrolizumab for one year. Uh, so all patients who have a high risk disease, uh, a chance of high recurrence, you would get this adjuvant therapy. Um, the class was on localized, so uh, a little a small statement on uh, patients who have uh, locally advanced disease or metastatic disease. We all know now the treatment of choice is immunotherapy and immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab is probably the treatment of uh, choice, and the other is pembrolizumab plus exitinib. So uh, every patient with localized. Uh, before that, we can do definitely. Uh, biopsy in these patients to find out whether it's the clear cell carcinoma or a non-clear cell carcinoma. Non-clear cell carcinoma, we all know, could be papillary carcinoma, chromophobe carcinoma, a collecting duct carcinoma, or a translocation, right? So the treatment may vary slightly, so a biopsy is indicated. Nowadays, usually we will go ahead and do uh, immunotherapy first, and if the patient responds, then we might do a cytoreductive nephrectomy. The only uh, choice of doing a cytoreductive nephrectomy before uh, giving immunotherapy would be if you can remove 75%, more than 75% of the tumor burden. So there you can do a cytoreductive nephrectomy or if there is oligometastatic disease, there is a single metastasis. So you can do a radical nephrectomy along with metastatectomy, which will almost cure the patient. And this is followed by some uh, adjuvant uh, immunotherapy. I think this is in nutshell the uh, management of uh, RCC. Uh, if you have any query or uh, Dr. Nachiket, if you want to have comment. I wanted to ask you, uh, what is the heat sink phenomenon? Uh, the, the, uh, the other thing that I missed is the thermoablation. Thermoablation is the patients who are not fit for surgery, um, where uh, they do not want any kind of uh, uh, invasive surgery, thermoablation is another treatment of choice where we can do either radio frequency or cryoablation. So Dr. Nachiket is asking, what is a heat sink phenomenon in uh, RF ablation? Can you just, uh... okay. So yeah, I think uh, we need to uh, look into that exactly what is the term because of the most no, of yeah. us. Yes, please yeah, go I ahead. To, first of all, I okay, come here, that, uh... come here. If you put something on a slide, then you should know everything about it. And we've uh, talk, talked about this multiple times. The problem about all these uh, ablative uh, uh, procedures is that if you're using an energy source like a laser, or if you're using, say, a cryoprobe, then the temperature which would be present at the tip of the probe would be different than the temperature which is present at the periphery. So what happens is that if you're planning to cook a tumor to 55 degrees, that 55 degrees would be at the tip of the laser. Or say minus 30, minus 40 would be at the tip of the cryo probe. Now, if you're uh, doing it for a tumor, say about two to three centimeters, then the temperature would subsequently either fall or it will increase. So you do not get a homogeneous type of 
you know, a temperature inside the tumor. This is exactly how a heat sink works. For example, if you have a cable below, which is heating a water source, then the temperature near the cable would be higher and at the surface it would be less. So one of the problems of these is that the heat sink phenomena, the tumor might not receive the same temperature that it's receiving. They, they can be a heterogeneous, you know, temperature. So you should uh, know this. This is the reason for failure or this is the reason for one of the problems of using these therapies. The second question I wanted to ask you was, are there any head-to-head -head comparisons of, say, the standard of care, like a partial nephrectomy versus in any of these triablative procedures or, say, a laser in thermotherapy or something? Do you have any head-to-head -head data to present to us? Yeah, I think that's, that's very important. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, very nicely described, uh, Dr. Nachiket, uh, about the heat sink phenomenon and uh, what is its drawback when we do a radio frequency ablation and the chance of recurrence probably is uh, high because of one of these uh, problems. So, um, Sorry, any, anybody? Yes, Adi. Yeah, Sorry, just Nachiket. Go ahead. Inside the cable that we presented inside the venous system, they also took patients who had N1 lymphomas. Why at all were N1 lymphomas uh, patients you know, taken up for this study? And uh, wouldn't it be a drawback because N1 means it's already like this? So, did you look into that uh, paper and code that you put on slide? Uh, Dr. Nachetike is asking whether uh, in one of these uh, ablative studies, uh, they took N1 lesions also. So, what was the reason? Why did they take N1 lesion? Uh, because this becomes a high risk disease. Um, so, any idea? But no. So, uh, I think these patients probably were unfit for surgery. So, they were giving uh, some time, uh, some kind of palliative therapy to these patients. So, uh, but it, again, it's a very important point uh, to be noted. Uh, so, I think, uh, Yash, uh, very, it is very important that you go uh, into the details of these things. The one is, as he said, whatever you put on your presentation, you must know each and everything of that. Otherwise, don't put it. Uh, secondly, uh, try to go into more kind of a, a journal study. Uh, see more of references, uh, as you said, whether there is a head-to-head -head trial of thermoablation and uh, partial nephrectomy. I think these things are uh, quite important to make the uh, presentation more interesting and more uh, so that we can learn even more from your presentation. Anybody else? Yes, Adi. What is What 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 should be uh, the amount of nephrons or kidney tissue left behind for doing a partial nephrectomy? What is the minimum amount? So it is said that at least twenty percent of the all nephrons should be left behind if you are doing a partial nephrectomy. Margin. So, huh? margin. No, no, not much. Not margin. margin is not a problem nowadays because we do enucleation also. So margin uh, is not a problem. Uh, you can do enucleation without any margin also. Uh, and they usually, when you do a partial effect, they keep one to two millimeter margin. Uh, and now with ultrasound, we are able to know exactly how deep it is. And so usually we are able to uh, do without uh, compromising uh, with your nephron. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Partial nephrectomy. The hemostatic agents uh, used during partial nephrectomy. Can you name some of them? What are they? Uh, so, so, so I think you 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 should know uh, because many of us would not use nowadays any hemostatic agent uh, because uh, we do uh, suturing, uh, which is quite enough uh, for hemostasis. Um, but yes, uh, previously we used to put bolsters also, uh, and then there are uh, solutions also available, uh, where adhesives also available, where, where we can, which can be used as uh, hemostatic agents. But most of the patients, most of the patients would not require any kind of other hemostatic agents. Uh, so again, a partial nephrectomy could be done either open 
uh, laparoscopic or robotic, uh, all the three approaches are equally valid. Yes, anybody else? Yes, you have a question. Uh, for localized cancer, yes, as I said, uh, there is a risk recurrence uh, uh, prognostic uh, calculator. As you said, UCLA calculator, they have a, if the risk of recurrence is more than 30% in that kind of period. So risk recurrence is, is uh, measured by the Furman's grading. So intermediate, high and high risk category, all these have a higher risk. So these patients may be given pembrolizumab for one year, right? And uh, if they are not uh, high risk uh -huh. patients, then active surveillance is done in this patient. So nothing is required. Anybody else? Yes. Pardon? Hypo. Yes, yes. So most of these patients of uh, ablation would require a, a pre op biopsy. So, usually we do uh, uh, just before uh, doing a thermoablation. Right? Sometimes you can do a frozen section biopsy also. Uh, but yes, uh, the indication of a biopsy in renal masses is one of the uh, is uh, that if you want to do a thermoablation. Yes. Anybody else said anything? Uh, I think uh, if nobody has any other query or any, I think in among the participants, if somebody has any. Uh, okay, thank you. So uh, thank you everybody. Uh, Dr. Manoj, I would request the, our moderator, Dr. Manoj to give his last comments and wrap up this session. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Manoj. Thank you. Yes, uh, for good presentation and thank you, sir, for the valuable information. Good day. I thank all the participants and all those who might have joined us today on Zoom and uh, YouTube. Uh, have a good day.